Hello, my name is Scott McSwain, and this is a presentation on greenhouses, both hobby greenhouses and commercial greenhouses. I'm a master gardener from the 2022 cohort, and I built uh, with my husband and managed this 100 foot hobby greenhouse that you can see in the photo, and also have experience in larger glass structures being on the board of the W.W. Seymour Conservatory in Wright Park and helping to plant some of the plants that you can see there today after, after the renovations. I grew up on a farm in Tennessee and got a lot of my plant love and knowledge from my mom and my grandma. And I moved here to Tacoma about five years ago uh, from Korea, where I was working as an educator and I work as a public educator. Now, this presentation is gonna be a deep dive into greenhouses and connects two program priorities at least, nearby nature and clean water. Some of the things that we do in greenhouses can cause problems due to rot runoff and chemicals seeping into the ground. And we know that the, those uh, chemicals make their way into our streams and oceans. So let's take a look at some of the things we're gonna be learning about today. So the learning objectives for this presentation are to know the principles of greenhouse construction and to understand principles of greenhouse lighting, irrigation, temperature control, pest management, and plant production. All the pictures that you see are mine, and a lot of the information has come from what I've been able to learn throughout the process of building my own greenhouse and um, volunteering at the conservatory. But I took a lot of information and the general structure of chapter 25 of the WSU Master Gardener Manual to guide the presentation. So feel free to check it out for more information about the things I'm presenting on today. And uh, let's get into the topics covered. Today, we will cover types of greenhouses that exist and that you can make or buy, uh, where to build your greenhouse, types of covering materials, growing surfaces, how to keep them hot or cold, ventilation, humidity and irrigation, light and fertilization recommended for greenhouses, and pest control. And I just have to point out this picture. This is a giant mammoth sunflower that we grew this last year behind the greenhouse and it's what made me plant so many sunflowers this year i just i just love them so as you can see in the photos my husband and i built our greenhouse about three years ago from a greenhouse kit there are a lot of companies that sell kits you can put together i installed my own exhaust system and cut custom shade cloth lined the inside and my, made my own um, above spray irrigation system. It's a huge project. It requires a lot of planning and maintaining. And you should consider the following if you are also thinking about building your own greenhouse. What plants are you wanting to grow and what are their needs? What space do you have? What location in potential areas where you could put it gets the most sunlight possible in the winter and in the summer? And then de depending on the plant needs, do you have nearby water? Do you have nearby electricity that you can run? Or, or could you run electricity and water to the unit? You can get into some zoning issues here as well. So it is a consideration based on where you are. You can see Lucy, my Westie, really helping us cut that, um, that shade cloth to the dimensions of the inside of the greenhouse. So let's get into the types of greenhouses. There is a type called a lean-to, which you, you've probably seen. It's like a half greenhouse that's split along the roof and it's it shares a wall with another structure. And there's also something that's similar called an even span, which is uh, that same type of idea, but it's a full-size greenhouse. And it, I've kind of broken these all into benefits and drawbacks. And one benefit is possible heat sharing from the wall and they're typically less expensive. You know, you're building less of a greenhouse, but you're really limited in, in the size and the structure of it just because uh, and, and the location because it has to be attached to an existing structure and so if you happen to i wouldn't be able to do anything like that in my backyard because i don't have a, a structure with a wall available where i would have ample sunlight but maybe you do um i had to choose a freestanding one which is the the third kind and benefits is that it really is more flexible in terms of where you can put it and it's easy to expand on later I was able to put it somewhere where it just gets maximum sunlight from morning to evening. But one drawback is it, I do have to have a heater. There's more heat loss. It's more expensive to heat. Um, and since it's not sharing the structure, I had to run water out to it. So in general, when it comes to site selection, you know, it really does depend on what you're looking to grow. If you want like a nice little 
fern sitting area greenhouse moment, which sounds like a dream, then your options in terms of where you can put the, the greenhouse are much more um, open. But in general, you want greenhouses to be in locations where you can get the maximum sunlight, especially considering the winter sunlight exposure. And so you want to avoid putting greenhouses on the northern side of anything that would cast a shadow onto the greenhouse. So if my, if my backyard did not go up and it was able to get sunlight even in the afternoon and evening, then I would have had to have chosen a different location just because of wanting to grow vegetables and tropical plants in my greenhouse for the majority of the, the months of the year. So there are lots of different covering materials that you can have as the outside main um, cover of your greenhouse. There's glass, which has very high light transmission um, and limited expansion and contraction when it when it's heated. You can see the the glass conservatory here in in WW Seymour with some of the Talancia that we hung there. Um, a drawback is that it's easily broken and it is expensive compared to the other materials. There's also fiberglass. I've seen fiberglass at like expos and in some people's backyards. It's not as common, but it is lightweight. It's strong, but it can easily catch on fire and it weathers rapidly compared to the other greenhouse covering materials. So the greenhouse covering material I chose is rigid plastic um, polycarbonate. And I chose it for a lot of reasons. It's very uh, rigid. I mean, it's in the name, but it is strong um, and flexible. There's high light transmission. Mine does come with a pre-applied like 15% shade uh, application. And some of the drawbacks though, is that it can expand and contract more with heat than glass. And there can be algae that, that springs up if it's not sealed well, um, but I silicone caulked every single um, seam. So I, I helped to, I try trying to find a way to, to help with the expansion and contraction. You can also do flexible plastic film. This is perfect for like a, a hoop house. Uh, it's inexpensive, but it def definitely doesn't last as long. So I have my, my polycarbonate greenhouse that's up all year. And I have a hoop house that I only have around one of my larger garden beds for the earliest spring months, like so that I can get some plants in the ground that might not like frost. So it's kind of like a makeshift, makeshift greenhouse for early planting. So for the growing surfaces inside of your greenhouse, there are two main ones, wire and metal. Uh, I chose wire mesh, mesh shelves. They are stronger and they last longer. Um, they are more expensive, but they last longer. So it, in the end, it was worth it to me. And they can rust. I find that the rust comes off pretty easily with a pressure washer. Uh, with the wooden frame surfaces, they're easy to find the, the materials to make them yourselves. You can customize them to be um, more to whatever height you need but it doesn't last as long as metal. Cedar and redwood are a good idea for the wood if you choose the wooden frame surfaces, but just know that pressure treated lumber can last three to five times longer than brushed or soaked lumber. So it is a consideration when building those surfaces. So there are three main types of ways you can heat your greenhouse. These first two are really for larger greenhouses, and I've only seen things like greenhouse space heaters for smaller hobby greenhouses, but I'm sure that there would be some type of, of radiator that is used for some of those that are kind of in between hobby and commercial. But the most common in commercial greenhouses are boiler systems, um, and there are pipes circulating hot water or steam, like you can see right here in the conservatory under that metal gate on the right are the pipes of the boiler. There are, all, are also forced air heaters, and it's like heating units with air blowing over the, the plants, and it's very inexpensive, but it can cast shade on plants, um, and it's heavy, so you have to secure it more from uh, above. And the one that I use is just a, a small greenhouse space heater. It's least expensive option for hobby greenhouses, uh, but it does only heat a small space. So that some people kind of insulate, do more insulation in their greenhouses, like by adding bubble wrap 
or um, by sealing it with silicone, which does help to keep it warmer in those winter months. So in terms of ventilation and cooling, shade cloth works to reduce temperatures and that intends direct sunlight. I use 40% shade cloth, that is a black woven plastic material you can see above the exhaust fan here. And while this can be used inside the greenhouse or on the outside, I sometimes do both in the case of a heat wave, but just make sure to make it secure so it's not blown away by the wind. And if inside, I recommend putting it behind whatever irrigation system you have just to keep uh, algae from forming on the shade cloth. They also have liquid shading materials. This is what the conservatory does um, or has done in, in its painting like a mixture of the one part white latex paint and 10 parts water um, on the glass and it helps to reduce temperatures but it's also something that normally is taken off in the fall when you want more sunlight. You can also do exhaust or ventilation fans like you see in the photo. Uh, it brings down my greenhouse temperature by 10 degrees whenever it kicks on. It has an automatic um, an automatic start that if it gets to be like around 95 degrees in the greenhouse, it kicks on to, to take it down to a temperature that plants tend to like a little bit more. And I have a couple fans in my greenhouse working to circulate air for vegetables. It's important to have just because you need that wind flow to kind of make the plants grow strong, have a, a, a more rigid cellular structure in the stem, but it's also good for controlling temperature. Now onto humidity and irrigation. So like with a lot of the topics we've talked about today, it is going to depend on what you're growing. Tropicals need higher humidity than desert plants, although um, cacti, do still like enjoying in the natural habitat experience a lot of humidity um, and if you are using your greenhouse primarily for propagation you're going to have to have a much higher humidity as well high humidity can though lead to disease and fungal issues um, and low humidity can stress plants out i use a spray system on a timer to spray for 20 or 30 seconds every 20 to 30 minutes in the summer months feels like um grocery store uh, produce aisle, it's kind of nice. Um, <laughs> but with a spray irrigation system, that is when ventilation becomes important as well to make sure that it's not so humid and so moist that it is creating the algae on the inside of the greenhouse and the fungal diseases on the plants themselves. So irrigation in larger greenhouses is something that is for sure automated, but um, I, I just use a hose in mine. Um, there's a variety of spray systems to and drop irrigation. The same system that I have that you can see in this photo um, for for kind of increasing humidity in my in my greenhouse. You can edit change. They they send a bunch of different uh, hoses and nozzles and things, and you can make it to where it's a drip system going around the greenhouse as well to water things. So automatic irrigation is definitely something possible for smaller greenhouses, although I like the kind of meditative moment of going around with a hose in the hand to, to water things and check on things. So light and fertilization. When it comes to light in many large facilities, especially if the facilities are focusing on, on seeds or propagating uh, or tropical plants, really far north, like here in the Pacific Northwest, you will see grow lights to increase plant growth, especially in those winter months. But most hobby greenhouses, they just grow based on the light available to them. So if you were to try to grow tropical plants in a greenhouse that you're actively heating here in the Pacific Northwest, then I, I do recommend having grow lights as a supplemental light during the longest part of the winter. Um, but I don't choose to do that. I choose to move my tropical plants inside and keep some of my dormant dahlias or um, some trees and vegetables, and cacti in the greenhouse during the winter. Cacti and even some tillandsia and jungle cacti can live throughout a, the winter here in an unheated greenhouse. I've done it. When it comes to fertilization, I, I really try to be careful of what I am keeping or when I'm fertilizing my plants within my greenhouse because it's so close to my vegetable garden. So I wouldn't use something like um, 
systemic granules. This is a popular thing to use for pest control and tropical plants. I make sure that the soil I mix does not have that because it is so close to where I'm, I'm harvesting vegetables. If you talk to me, <laughs> when we talk, I will talk about worm tea. I'm a big believer in it. You can use it often um, and you can use it for tropical plants as well as veggies. So it really does cover a wide gamut of, of plants that, that enjoy it. This also um, kind of circles back to the very beginning of this presentation when we were talking about program priorities such as clean water and soil health. It is it, always important to know that what you're doing in, in, in your work with plants, it will affect um, plants around us and uh, bodies of water around us. Um, in bigger greenhouses, they're going to use slow release granular, granular fertilizers and liquid fertilizers in the greenhouse uh, on this living wall. You can see that um, there is a drip system for irrigation, but also um, liquid fertilizer is used. So the ratio and the type to fertilizer, it's all gonna depend on the plant you're growing, if they're growing vegetables or fruit, or if it's more of a focus on leaf or on, on growth. Um, so it's all gonna depend on, on what you're growing. So when it comes to pest control in your greenhouse, there are a lot of things that you can do before you go to a pesticide. Um, and you will have pests, it is inevitable. It is part of owning plants. It's also part of, of working in a greenhouse. So keeping your greenhouse clean is a wonderful and a first line of defense, but also remembering integrated pest management. Um, so IPM. And that's you know not going immediately to pesticide, but thinking about the biological, mechanical, or those cultural controls first, um, and you know letting nature kind of be when you can. Um, plants can withstand quite a bit of leaf loss before um, they go into shock in general, and so I I find that letting plants be and kind of monitoring the situation. Using a hose um, is my favorite form of pest control. That's the best. Um, but kind of making sure that I don't immediately jump to pesticide. Um, I also really like to use praying mantis and ladybugs, uh, which also I see a lot of people wanting to use ladybugs, which I love, but but just not following the instructions cor correctly. So, you know, I see a lot of videos on TikTok of ladybugs being released in the day. Well, they're going to fall, they're going to fly away. I see um, ladybugs being released in dry surfaces. Well, they're going to look for water. So I, um, I recommend following the instructions, only releasing ladybugs at night after it's rained or after you've sprayed everything down and they should be kept in the fridge until you're ready to use them. Whenever I go to get ladybugs and they're, they're in a fridge, you know, they, they are moving slower. Um, and so getting them out of the refrigerator about 30 minutes to an hour before you're gonna be letting them go at night after you spray the, the plants off. Um, I also have a couple praying mantis egg sacs outside tied to some branches and excited for the temperatures to get consistently above 60 degrees for two to six weeks for them to hatch but using beneficial insects like ladybugs like praying mantis will also do a good job of keeping away pests that you don't want in your garden or in your greenhouse thank you so much for sticking with me to learn a little bit more about greenhouses if you like more information on this topic check out the wsu Master Gardener Manual, Chapter 25. And if you'd like to send me questions you have, it's scott.mcswain at gmail.com. Have a wonderful day, and I look forward to seeing you all in person where I will inevitably talk about worm tea. <laughs> Thank you.